Welcome back, everyone, to this part two of the special edition on Get Your Game On, the channel dedicated to immersive gaming experiences. So, in part one, we had special guest Jeff Weaver starting to walk us through all the intricacies of the Sim Racing Studio software and what it takes to make one of these motion platforms move. So we're going to continue that discussion today with part two, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Jeff's process, how he goes through actually making a profile, and also we're going to talk to him a little bit about the different types of simulators that he's utilized. So if you still need some more information about Sim Racing Studios and tuning uh, the motion profiles, stick around. It's coming up. Welcome everyone to part two of our series with the legend Jeff Weaver, the uh, tuning guru, uh, telemetry crew chief, I don't know, whatever else. But <laughs> what I can tell you is you won't find a better person and we are thrilled that you're willing to share your expertise with my viewers. Um, you know, it's, it's a real pr privilege and an honor to have you here, Jeff. So thanks again for uh, continuing to share your wisdom. So. In part one, uh, we talked a lot about smoothing, and and again, this is this is pretty behind the scenes, pull the curtain back kind of stuff. So uh, if you're just looking for some some uh, mindless entertainment, this probably isn't your best <laughs> option. We're getting pretty deep, but we're doing our best to explain something that's that's a little intimidating to a lot of people. So um, you know that's that's the reason for this, and that's the reason it's probably going to go long and everything. But uh, again. I'm going to take advantage. I got you on here. I'm going to take advantage as, as much as I can. So let's um, let's start off a little bit about, I think, talking about your process when you get a new game or whatever it is. What is your general process for setting up a tuning profile? Um, so there's a multi-layer piece. Um, I'll try to kind of summarize it. The first thing I'll do is, um, of course, load the sim. I won't even have motion on. Um, okay. I will turn off all my other accessories, so no shakers, no wind. Um, and I will drive the car um, maybe a couple laps or whatnot to do what I consider or call a preliminary telemetry grab. And what that is is when you go into some racing studio, um, you go into the games tab at the top, um, there'll be a section there for telemetry, um, and there's an ability to export telemetry um, while you're playing. And you don't have to have motion on it, because again, um, the telemetry is independent of a motion platform. It's always there. So once I click the export, um, it's creating a CSV file, basically an Excel file, in your Sim Racing Studio export documents folder. Um, and then I can open that up in Excel and analyze the telemetry. And I've created my own dashboard in Excel of looking at all these numbers so I can see them on a graph. What that allows me to do is first get what I call the first max telemetries. And what those um, do, I'll go into a little bit later, but those allow me to kind of get the platform in a basic state that's not going to throw me around like crazy. Right? Okay. So I put those in Sim Racing Studio, my max telemetries I've gathered, and I generally will set the sliders to maybe 10 all the way through, a very neutral position. Um, sometimes I adjust them a little bit, basically, because it's kind of like there are some consistencies in terms of how movement will occur for a car versus a plane versus whatnot. We'll go into that till later. And once I have that first setting, then I will go in and turn on the motion platform. Um, the first things I start to do, though, is get a first feel of how does it feel. Is it too crazy jarring? And generally, it'll feel okay-ish, like it'll move. Right. Um, and then what I do is um, drive for a little bit um, while I, um, just again, making sure everything's fine, I will then start to turn off all the axes and start with just say pitch and make sure pitch feels right in that sim. Turn off pitch and I go to roll. Make sure roll's feeling right with the, the, the corners or if it's a plane, how does that feel? Is it too jarring or whatnot? And the reason being is as I go through each axis is I don't want one axis impacting the other. I want to feel each axis because it's kind of like going back to cooking analogy. If one of my ingredients is spoiled, it'll ruin the entire dish. Right. So I need to make sure every axis feels fine on its own before I start trying to tune them all together. So I'll run through every axis, 
um, until I get to, you know, traction loss and whatnot. And during that time, within, say, pitch, I will be, one, adjusting the effect slider if it's pitching too much or if I wanted a little bit more, but not too much there. But mainly I'm focusing on the smoothing effects. Because, again, like we discussed before, smoothing effects is really for trying to solve telemetry issues, not using too much. So that way I can focus just on, say, pitch. Does it If I'm doing an airplane and I'm pulling back, is it pitching too much? Is it What is the climb rate? That's where it gets a little bit tricky with, say, flight sims because, again, as we discussed with the full roll and whatnot, I have to find the middle ground, and we'll get into that with max telemetry for, for aircraft as to when does when is the platform going to tilt all the way back? How fast does it tilt all the way back? Yep. Does it suddenly jerk you back and it doesn't feel immersive, or is there a progression to it? Um, so using the smoothing effects allows me to kind of balance that jerky feeling, you know, averaging the telemetry. And then once I feel like pitch is feeling pretty good, I go to roll. And then I go to sway. If I'm doing yaw in a helicopter, I do yaw then, and then all the way down through heave, and then traction loss. Okay. Once I have them all what I consider kind of tuned individually, I then turn them all together. Mm-hmm. And during this time as well, I am learning and and working to drive the car or fly the plane as well as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's rather rather easy, depending on the car. Um, Sometimes it can take days to get to the point where I feel proficient in it, right? Um, Yeah. One of the best ones, memories I had was uh, someone, it was like Bathurst weekend, um, and um, they wanted a tuning for iRacing for one of the supercars there. And... um, I was watching a lot of the Bathurst drivers and they do a lot of heel toe shifting. And I realized I needed to learn that. One of the things I'm also passionate about is like, I want it to be as real as possible as well. Immersive, but like, so if I'm tuning it and the guys are doing heel toe shifting, I'm going to learn how to do heel toe shifting. So like it took me three days to kind of get okay with it. (laughs) And then another two days to feel like I could actually do a couple laps in Bathurst and not crash. Okay. Um, and the same thing with flight. You're like, there's many times I've gotten into flight sims. I'm like, okay, how do I turn this aircraft on? Yeah. <laughs> like, where's yeah. the cold start? Yeah. Um, yeah. And X Plane 11 is one of those ones that's not always friendly about that. So, you know, I, I, I need to get professional with the car while I'm feeling those initial movements and identifying what doesn't quite feel right still. Um, because I can't really feel what the car is going to be doing or the aircraft is going to be doing unless I'm pushing it to those limits. If I'm just tuning it casually and someone comes along and and uses a profile that's proficient with the car, they're going to be like, this feels too weak. Yeah. Uh, And just to break in real quick, this, this is because Jeff kind of is known to make the profiles. And as we talked about in part one, he does the profiles that, you know, everybody can download. So he's not just tuning for himself. Most of his profiles are, going to go out to the wild and everybody's going to at least start with them. So that's why he's, he's got a lot bigger load to carry than the majority of us out there where we're just doing it for ourselves. So again, thank you for all that effort. Too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Effort. And we the little secret it. there is, is pretty much all the default profiles that you get initially are usually ones that I've done. Um, if I've tuned it, um, cause I've worked with some racing studio and then kind of integrated those. But, um, so once I get proficient at the car, And I feel like I can, you know, and I'll use the AI or I'll use online racing to feel like I'm competitive or flight sims or whatnot. Um, Then that's when you get into, like, the effect sliders. And the effect sliders are how you start to adjust things to make a Porsche 911 feel like a Porsche 911 or feel like an off-road vehicle feel like an off-road vehicle. Feel a Cessna 172 feel like that versus an F-16 or an F-18. Yep. Um, and, we'll, and, and I'll adjust those sliders. Um, I'll adjust other things then at that point time, whether it's things like um, the gear smoothing factor um, or other effects that might be in there, such as the um, engine haptic effects um, or other effects, making sure things are working right, like, say, the canopy effect um, or the, things like that, or, like, say, an IL-2 or DCS. Um, some of them have telemetry uh, spikes and surge for, like, say, the cannons, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, versus, say, a machine gun. Um, so I go through and I adjust all those pieces. Um, 
And I keep doing that and I track my changes as well as in Excel. So like I'll have my base tuning, that first one I, I do with the tins and whatnot, or maybe adjust some sliders and on my max telemetries. And then every time I go a change, I'll do a new row and I'll mark what those changes were. So as I go through, you know, sometimes six, seven different changes, I can track what that particular change is um, over time. So if See, I'm like, oh. this is why we have Jeff on, because I just remember, <laughs> oh, no, I'll remember that number. I'll remember how to do that. This is exactly like why you're who you are, because of all that. I mean, very few people are going to do that. But, yeah. man, so, again, I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, oh, yeah, no. you make it sound like we all do this. Yeah, we got our spreadsheet and we just kind of run it. It's like, no. This is yeah. why you're so awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> and some of these files are huge um, yeah. in terms of just the, the, the telemetry that I capture. Because again, you, you turn on telemetry capture for five minutes, um, it captures um, telemetry not as fast as say the exporting is um, for the the sim, but it, it, it'll capture twenty uh, pieces of data every second. Mm. Um, and then I put that into an Excel sheet. So five minutes of data is 60,000 rows of data that I then combine into a dashboard of graphs so I can look at that and go, okay, here is where the telemetry is spiking. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to get to drug errors too much. We'll get in that in a second. But that is where I use that data to put into those, those initial numbers. Right. And then um, once I have that tuning and I'm starting to, to, to do the sliders, I kind of have all the elements. I have the max telemetry is kind of set where I want because I've been tracking that over time. I have this, the effects of sliders where I want, where I have them over time. I do go through a kind of a final phase where if I'm tuning for, say, iRacing or Set of Corsa right. or DCS, I will have all the tunings that I have in a bottom section, which were finalized. And I go, for this particular tuning, for this aircraft, say a Cessna 172, where does it fit in performance-wise against all the other aircraft I've done for that particular okay. sim? So that way I can go, okay, oh, wow. okay, I want the Cessna 172 to maybe be a little bit more responsive in surge versus the Cessna 152. I That a F-16 should have a lot more maneuverability and, and performance than, say, the Cessna. And a Cessna compared to, like, yeah, a 747 will have more performance, right? Right. So I, I put those in a, in a graph, and I want to call it stack ranking. But I look at, like, one of the main things I look at is, like, the comparison of their telemetry of max telemetries of sway and surge. Um, heave is really just independent. It's like, it's like the road telemetry and whatnot, right. which can roll or just, you know, rotational axes. But when you get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of performance for a vehicle, it's sway and surge, whether it's an aircraft or – you know, um, a, a race car. And I'm able to kind of look at that and go, okay, where should the effect sliders be, right, as I tune it so that I can make a Mazda MX-5 feel like an MX-5 and a Porsche 919 feel like a Porsche 919. Um, and so once I kind of get it in there, um, I'm like, okay, I make those fine tune adjustments. How does it still feel? Do I need to make any adjustments back to heave? Do I need to make any adjustments to, to, uh, to the smoothing? Um, and then the very final test um, that I've used probably since the very beginning um, is, is it the fun test? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, my, and my wife knows about it um, because I'll be racing and I start laughing <laughs> or I start yelling because I'm having too much fun, or I'm crashing, and I'm yeah. no longer thinking about what needs to be adjusted. Yeah. I'm immersed in the experience. Yeah. And the moment I have those, like, ah, that was crazy, I know it's done, yeah. and it's time to move on to the next one. So that's nice. that's kind of my process. Um, wow. And I will do usually a video review. So I make my videos, um, you know, that I post, um, but usually there are many videos that aren't ever posted or seen because I want to video the rig movement near the end on the final tuning, and I right. review it. I look at it and go, does it look like it's working right? A big thing I'm passionate about is I'll watch videos of people with motion rigs. I'm like, the motion isn't even matching what I see on the screen, right? <laughs> right. It's like, it's got to yeah. match. What's well, moving you? 
<laughs> it's, it's moving. moving. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look anything like, you know, what it should look like. Right. Um, so I really make sure, like, I'll look at it and I'm like, yeah, traction loss doesn't look like it's moving enough. Let me crank that up. You know, or this doesn't look like, I, you know, like the sway. What was something recently I was looking at and then now analyzing the role of my, some of my motion uh, tunings on some of the more banked um, or slightly non-banked road courses. And I was like, you know, I think I have too much roll there. It's not really matching what I see right. visually. Right. You know, it might feel okay, but it's not giving me what I consider the realistic experience as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I started making some adjustments there. Um, even after two years of doing a lot of tunings, I, you know, I went back. And said, okay, I need to adjust this value. And I don't do that lightly. Trust me. Yeah. It was very much like a, a, a long three, four month review process. Yeah. Talking to people watching my videos. I was like, okay. I, and literally it was one digit change. It was changing the max telemetry of, of roll from seven to eight for most of my role, for most of my racing plans. That's like an oh. act of Congress for Jeff to change the digit. <laughs> it pretty much was. So, you know, and, and here's what's cool. So all this work that goes into that, Jeff only charges $100 per profile. <laughs> so send the check to me and I'll get, no, that's what's amazing. So you, you guys are hearing all this work that goes into this. I mean, all the tracking, everything. And Jeff gives this to the community. Yeah. I mean, he and, doesn't and, charge anything for all this. No. And the community has been great. People have yeah. donated you know, things and, and, yeah. and help me out, which is awesome. But, you know, I, I love it. And a lot of the reward, the biggest reward for me is seeing someone say like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Or you, you know, or like you made the platform like, like yeah. come to life for me. And yeah. that's, that's just awesome. Right. Well, so, in, in part one, we talked about the importance of customizing it. So if you just yeah. have that generic raw uh, information, it's like, it's, it's a completely different experience once you get a good tuned profile in there. And yeah. so, so yeah, the community. I, I think I can speak on behalf. We are so thankful. You're <laughs> you're who you are with your OCD and your, your meticulous note taking because we all get to benefit from that. So thank you for that. I mean, that's what's so cool. So, uh, um, so yeah, that's the process, guys. So uh, yeah. get out that's your spreadsheets the, and let's go. Exactly. <laughs> so, it's, and it's just, it's again too. You know, I, I understand. Trust me, I've, I've wanted to try to do a tuning video. Every time I start to do it, I try to write like a script. Yeah. But then it becomes like this giant long essay and I'm like, oh, this is just too overwhelming. And how do I and it's it's the same thing with like, you know, I, I and I love this because like a lot of people get some ideas yeah. and I go, it's like it's like cooking. Go out and experiment. Yeah. One of the biggest things I think I've always had an issue with in the very beginning was people would say, well, just adjust the sliders until it feels good. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I get that. But I was like. No, there's something there. There's something yeah. that hasn't been discovered yet. And my goal with the motion tuning guide was just to explain, like, what is it when you do move the slider, what's happening? What yeah. What is happening yeah. in the background? What is, what is the difference between max telemetry and what is an effect slider? And how yeah. do they relate to each other? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was something I just was passionate about figuring out and documenting. And I still learn new things all the time. Well, and again, in part one, you already taught me stuff on the smoothing. So, so Jeff, tell me your thoughts on IntelliTune. Tell me about that and, and what you think about that. Um, yeah, IntelliTune is really cool. Um, Sim Racing Studio added it a while ago. And what it is is basically utility or um, an ability for someone to go in and capture telemetry and get a suggested tuning based off of how they were driving. So kind of like what I was describing before in terms of um, how I go through and I capture telemetry and put it in Excel and analyze it um, and all the work that goes into that. What Atilatune does is simplifies that um, so that you don't have to go to Excel and will suggest some max telemetries and settings based off of the driving um, that you performed, as well as other information that it can gather, whether it was other tunings that I've done um, or other tunings people have done um, to kind of give you and put you into the ballpark. Um, the things for IntelliTune I would always tell people to really be careful of and be aware of is it's going to base the tuning off of that three minutes of driving for one track. Ah, right? yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you're not going to get a variance in terms of pitch or whatnot um, and, and things like that. So, you know, it might be very different if you drive it on Spa versus if you buy it, drive it on Sebring, which is very flat. So that, that is one thing to consider, as well as your performance during driving. 
So if you're going around and, and, and losing traction a loss or hitting the curves hard or going off the road during that three minutes, you're going to get some spiked values that will probably make the tuning feel a lot more uh, timid when you're actually using it. So I would say if you're using Intellitune, use a track that you're well, that you know, use a track that might have some little hills on it or whatnot, doesn't need to be crazy or anything like that. Okay. Um, and um, be really aware of your driving <clears throat> for that three minutes <clears throat> because if you go and you hit a curb or if you skid out, well, that's going to adjust the traction loss and whatnot. So try to drive it as well as you can. Okay. Um, and then you can use those settings of the soft, medium, and, and hard, which kind of adjust it from there. So it's, it's really just a means to quickly get in the ballpark so that you can start adjusting it as you go. So would you recommend doing that or would you recommend starting with one of your profiles? If I, if you have a, if I have a profile for that car, I would suggest with one of my profiles. Main okay. reason is because I spend a lot of time evaluating the maximum. More, more than three minutes? More than three minutes. <laughs> Sometimes uh, with most cars, it's almost 20 minutes of data across four separate tracks. Um, and then I do a process, what I call evaluated max telemetry, where I look at it and I'll find, you know, within the graph, um, what the, the average is at. And if you look at the the, the motion tuning guide, I'll have an image of what that might look like. Okay. You'll see spikes, but I'm, I'm trying to find what those averages are. Um, whereas IntelliTune, yeah, you just have three minutes on one track. But again, if I don't have a tuning um, and it's on a car that you, uh, there's, you know, never driven before, it's a great way to start. All right. Kind of so it's kind of the, the, the default backup. So, yep, so exactly. if you have the options for one of Jeff's tune-ups, start there and then you can adjust that. Or worst case, IntelliTune it and it'll get you close but but yeah. again find a representative track that has a little bit of everything and drive like a not drive crazy good. man <laughs> <laughs> you can you can drive crazy later and crash but on this three minutes it's reading it drive sanely so that you have a good base yeah. uh tune-up to go yeah and, it, and, and, and push the car i mean push the car to the limits because yeah. again you don't want to you don't want to be safe either um you you really want to capture what the, the potential of that car is able to do gotcha so, uh, so get good. Yeah. As, as the kids would say, get good, new, yeah. un uninstall. So, okay, well, that's great advice. Um, you know, and I've wondered about the IntelliTune, but I always, I, I, a lot of times I'll start with what you have and then I'll adjust from there. Um, yeah. And, and unfortunately it's not available for all the Sims. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's available for like a lot of flight Sims, but, um, for flight, that's why I said it's a lot more like dependent upon the style of yeah. flight you're doing whether it's like a, a commercial or jet or whatnot and pitch and roll is where the biggest differences are, are starting to make i was gonna uh, say i guess intellitune would work for fly i mean i guess that would work but it it's not really dependent on the track anymore <laughs> yeah it, and that's where it gets weird because you go like that was one of the experiments i did with my um last dof reality profile for microsoft flight simulator is I had some feedback where it just couldn't feel a lot of the transitional changes in pitch of just small movement. So right. I ended up lowering the max telemetry so you could just barely move and you would feel the movement in it. But the negative is, is that when you kind of do the other things, it starts to become jarring. Yeah. So for IntelliTune, it becomes difficult as well because it's like, well, there's not a standard of that particular and it's a feel more than anything else. And it depends yeah. on the flight, right? If you take off and you land and you don't do anything else, and you just pretty much go in a straight line with some banking, well, those values will be pretty low, right? What is the normal pitch angle for uh, an AV to, to take off? It's like less than five degrees, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Five to 10. So it's like your pitch telemetry will never go above 10. So you set the yeah. max telemetry to 10, well, you're good, but now it's kind of, it might be too jerky. Right? Yeah. It's, it's tricky. Yeah. It's it's all again a lot of feel on this stuff. So well, at least we have a place to start now. And hopefully yeah. for those of you out there that have never even touched the motion platform, as far as the profiles, they try the IntelliTune. I mean, yeah. that would be a good place to start, or get one of Jeff's. And I'm, I'm telling you from experience, that it's a night and day experience from going from a generic setup to an actual tune profile. So it'll be like you bought a whole new simulator. It'd be like your rig's a completely new rig. Um, it's it makes that big of a difference. So. Don't be scared of it. <laughs> we better talk about max telemetry because yeah. I think this is one that people are afraid to touch or don't know about it. Or I, I, This was the biggest thing that made the biggest difference when I was trying to tune my profiles. Yep. And when I and I watched your stuff and I read your stuff and I, I kind of understood it. But let's talk about max telemetry because I think this is a keystone 
for proper motion tuning. So I'll give yep. you the floor. Okay. So this is the one where our, uh, that I also get all the most questions on as to like, what is exactly max telemetry and how does it um, impact the effect slider? So within some racing studio on the far right side and the, and the black boxes is, is a, is a number, which is the max telemetry value. The best way that I can put what max telemetry is, is, Max telemetry tells Sim Racing Studio when to move the motion platform to the maximum amount of potential movement on that axis. So what does that mean? <laughs> so the first thing to remember is that, as we discussed, every Sim and every car is different. So that telemetry that comes out from the Sim, when I go around a corner fast and it's going to send out a telemetry value for sway, that value in some sims could be three. It could just be the number three. In other sims, it could be eight. For one sim, say iRacing, when you turn right in a car, say a Mazda MX-5, uh, the telemetry value might be 15 as you're going around a corner as fast as you can. Yeah, and just, Look, to, just to break... You know, break in here. The max telemetry, there is no standard. There's not like a max telemetry division of the U.S. government. Max telemetry is whatever the programmer oh. decides it is. There's absolutely can be anything, like Jeff's exactly. saying. So that's so there is no standard. It can be anything. So it can be anything, exactly. And so and it, and it will be anything, and it will be different for each car in a sim because of the like say again yeah. in, in I racing the MX5 is 15. You load up a Porsche 911, it'll be 24. You load up a Porsche 919, which is a prototype super fast car, it'll be like 32. You load up the F1 that came out in iRacing, it'll be like 35. And for flight sims, um, similar. Um, if you're loading up a Cessna 172, the surge value might be 7. You load up um, an F18 and you take off from a carrier, it's going to be like 42 or something. Right? Yeah. So... What max telemetry does is, is it looks at, it's a setting that says, well, let me take a step back. So here are these numbers that are coming out that are all different. The big question that always goes into play, which is, well, then how, how does the motion platform know when to move, right? Does it move to its maximum amount when the value is three? Does it move to the maximum amount in sway when the value is eight? And what max telemetry setting does is says, hey, when the sim puts out this number, move the platform to the maximum amount of movement. Yeah. So that if you're racing a Porsche 919 and the, and the value is, you know, um, 32, it says, hey, when a value of 32 from sway comes up, move the platform as much as you can on the sway axis to that, to when that 32 value comes up. And as it goes back down to zero, it'll move it back. So that's all that max telemetry is doing because every sim is different. Every car is different. And Sim Racing Studio doesn't know what that value is going to be because it's like until you load up the car and drive it, there's no telemetry. Right. So max telemetry, again, tells, sim, tells um, is a setting within Sim Racing Studio so that when that value comes in from the sim, Sim Racing Studio knows when to move the platform to that maximum amount of potential movement. Right. What the effect slider does is it says, okay, now I know how much, you know, that there's going to be a value and it's going to, I can move the platform when these values come in. The effect slider says how much I should move the platform when that value comes in, right? So I know I can go over to 32 for the Porsche 919, right. but should I move all the way? Well, right. if I want to move all the way, I set it all the way to 20. Yeah, 20 is the maximum on the, 20 on the is the maximum on the effect slider. The next question that comes into play is like, well, don't I want my platform to move to the most potential I bought by just cranking everything to 20? Question. I can answer that. <laughs> You're a student here. Good so here's the trick on that. You would think, crank it all to 20 and you're good. Well, Elite Dangerous found this one out. Mm -hmm. So an Elite Dangerous, uh, it's a space sim. Um, and in a space sim, it's different. So you don't maintain the roll. It's basically whenever you roll, it, it it pitches it, and then as soon as you release it, it goes back to level. So it's a different experience. But in Elite Dangerous, I tend to like to get in dogfights, and I'm doing a lot of looping. And then I would every once in a while hit my turbo. Well, the problem is 
if I'm in a full turn and then I hit the afterburner, it doesn't kick at all. It mm-hmm. just because you're already maxed out. So in Elite Dangerous, I have my pitch set to 15 so that I always have that little five for the afterburner to kick in. So that's why you don't that's, do it. Am, am I right, Jeff? That's it. That's it. Because you leave the headroom yep. for other motion to occur. That's why you rarely will see a lot of my tunings ever have a max of 20. Like, like the only ones I really do that on is maybe the roller coaster sim. Because yeah. there's not going to be a lot of other things versus pitch and roll going on. Yeah. So that's the, the effect slider is <laughs> one is allowing headroom for other effects to occur. But I also like to say, this is how you make a a a, a small go kart feel like a go kart and yeah, a, yeah. a top fuel, you know, like an eliminator or like an F one feel like an F one or no, top, top fuel. Let's stay with top yeah. fuel. Yeah, <laughs> or if you or if you make a um, a, a a fighter jet feel different than say a World War One plane, right, right? You know, it's it's adjusting those movement values, right? Like you go like, well, I want to move all the way over there. It's like, yeah, but it's gonna be fast and jerky. Like, but on this plane, you might only want to move halfway, right? And move this way. And that way, when you have that experience of flying the plane and you fly something different, there's a change in terms of the movement, yeah. the change in terms of the immersion. And that's how you balance things and make a, an off-road car by having a lot more heave available than, say, sway. Um, you might have a lot more roll in an off-road vehicle because of the suspension versus, yeah. say, F1. Yeah. Um, or like you say... And elite dangerous and other things, you need to have the headroom within surge and pitch so that you can feel when you kick in an afterburner. Mm-hmm. So the, there's two things that go into the effect slider. One is how much movement is going to be on that axis, but also how is it being prioritized against all the other effects, right? So again, a motion platform can only move on so many different axes. So if you have an H3, you have three axes, but there's six DOFs. There's six movement axes. So there has to be a decision as to which one is prioritized. So it knows, so it isn't breaking and exploding your platform all at the same time because it's trying to do everything at once and therefore yeah. your platform like comes apart. So you prioritize those particular effects. Um, for me, for racing, the prioritize is usually going to be surge. You want to feel the braking. You want to feel the yeah. corners. Yeah. So it's going to be surge and sway um, and traction loss. For flight sims, it's generally going to be pitch and roll, right? Yeah. Those are the effects that you're feeling when you're moving the plane around and with surge and heave when you're landing. So there's always that balance that goes on, on um, that's occurring within the, the effect sliders as well. So again, the max telemetry tells when to move to the most to the potential of the maximum movement. Yeah. The effect slider is how you balance that potential movement and may, and how you prioritize it against all the other effects. Yeah. So I I, uh, I learned that on uh, you know when I was messing with it, it's like when I was in the F eighteen, if I wanted to you know like I'd pull back on the stick hard and and just feel what did it feel like. And it was always like, no, this is a fighter. It needs to be snappier. It needs to, it needs to go. And so I would just turn down that max telemetry until I got that snap that I wanted. Now, the counter to that is you lose the motion a lot quicker. So all of a sudden you're maxed out. But in a fighter jet, I want to be, you know, yeah. around. so, yeah. you know, yeah. I always bring that max telemetry down and that's how I achieve that snappiness versus like you say, a Cessna, you just want a nice gradual and it can just keep tilting back nice and slow. Exactly. No problem. So exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about. That's that's it. Like the max telemetry as well could be looked. So so the max telemetry is malleable as well, right? Okay. Um, and it depends on the axis. So um, I my guidance is generally like unless you really kind of know the impact of max telemetry, just leave them alone. But hopefully the 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 users after watching the video will have a better idea yeah. what it does. Because what you're doing as well is you're again you're telling the platform when to move to its maximum potential range. So if I start to lower the max telemetry, that's the, the telemetry coming from the sim is the same. It doesn't change. Yeah. So like for like for example, on a flight sim, again for pitch, you have from zero to to ninety to one hundred and eighty, and then it switches to the negative to one hundred and eighty, and then back to ninety and back to zero again. So the thing is, is okay when I pull back on the stick and I'm going straight up, the telemetry will shoot up to ninety. Right. So you go, well, 
should I set the max telemetry to 90? Well, what that means is if your rig can only tilt back 10 degrees. Right. Right. And, and it's saying that you're going 90 degrees up. Well, if I set the max telemetry to 90, that means as I go up, as it gets close to 90, it's going to be very tilty, maybe five degrees at 45. And then once I get to 90, it's finally at, at 10 degrees. Right. Yeah. Like, well, as you said, that doesn't feel snappy. It takes a while. So you lower the max telemetry to say like 35 or 20 so that when you get to um, 20 degrees and we're starting to pull up, the, 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 the rig will pull up faster and yep. get quicker to where you're trying to go. Whereas with a Cessna, you might set it to 45, so it takes right. a little bit of time. Exactly. And there, and there does come a point for immersion that I have found that once you hit about 45 degrees in the game, it's like you're kind of already tilted back as far as you can go. Yeah. There's not going to be a difference in terms of what you feel between yeah. 70 and 90 degrees when you're up here yeah. and so on. So that's where the max telemetry for pitch and roll specifically and even yaw for flight sims becomes very malleable, right? Yeah. You don't want to go off of what the numbers are. And rarely right. do I do because I'm like, I know what this is going to be. So for for jet, I usually have it snappier for or or I might increase it depending on how how extreme it is. Like it, aerobatic planes get really crazy, so generally sometimes you want to have a little bit of a higher value to, to tame it because it can because it can go so fast. Yeah. Yeah. So there are those malleable pieces for pitch roll, um, and then jumping over to sim racing, most tracks will be flat. Now, there are exceptions such as Spa, which will have, you know, um, and uh, Verdillion, which you go up. It's, it's, yeah, it's like a 10, 15 degree incline. Um, you go to Laguna Seca, there's the Corkscrew. Mm -hmm. um, you go to other tracks will have, um, you know, different degrees of pitch and roll. What I have found is I generally use a pitch um, max telemetry of seven. And that kind of gives you the middle ground because so that way you can still feel the pitch change in Donington. Yeah. But not get like, you know, but still feel some extreme on spa. Right. right. Um, and the same thing with roll in terms of the banks. So I usually use those, but as we just discussed, sometimes I might tweak it a little bit because maybe it's, it's tilting too much. Yeah. So again, it's max telemetries um, can be changed from the perspective of, I want it to be snappier. Yeah. I want, you know, if I've already moved the effect slider all the way to 20 and it's trying to move it all the way over the platform, the left and right as, as much as I can, but still feels a little dull, lower the max telemetry yep. point or two. Because yeah. now it's going, to, it's going to get to that point a lot faster because the telemetry stays the same, but the max telemetry is lower. Yeah. So it reaches that point faster and moves that actually, you know, the actuator or the motor that right. faster. To that that, that's what I would tell people if you're tuning. Don't be afraid of that. Don't go crazy and change them all. But just just dial it a couple. Try a couple points and then a couple points. And it, you will be surprised at how much it, it makes a difference. I mean, that really was the biggest setting that, that I could get what I wanted to feel out of the thing. And I kind of look at the pitch degrees. I almost, in my head, look at it as whatever that number is, is kind of the angle I'll have the plane at when it goes to maximum. So like yes. if it's 25, when my HUD is at 25 degrees, I'm moved all the way I, that my platform can do. And mine does about a, a 10 or 11 degrees now with the new yeah. uh, the new deal. So, you know, it gives you that. But that's don't be afraid of it. But, uh, you know, also respect it in small baby steps. But, yeah, because uh, you, can, you can definitely lower it too much where it just yeah. becomes jerky all the time. And you can do yeah. everything with the effect sliders and everything else. So I always look at it as like the max telemetry is one of those values I might adjust last. Yeah. After I have my smoothing, the effect slider, or I'm cranking it up to 18, 20, and yep. I'm like, can't go higher. It's like, I want a little bit, I'll yep. adjust that. And trust me, I am adjusting the max telemetry on heave all the time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, That's the biggest one for me. Because, again, you, it spikes all around. So you're like, yeah. where is that middle ground? Where does it feel good where it feels on the runway, but it doesn't break my spine when I do a hard landing? Those well, and that's my, my problem with DCS with that one is when you, when you hook up to the shuttle on the catapult, if you don't clear it, that'll th send you into a, I mean, violent, violent. Oh, yeah. So that's like my maximum. How much of that can I tolerate before I, you know, before it's just going to really hurt? So yeah. that's that's my upper limit. And then the lower limit is so it feels solid when I hit. 
Yep, and in the tuning guide, I have a section about bad telemetry, right? Like DCS, yes. for whatever reason, likes to spike sway when you connect to a catapult hook for some reason. Yeah, it also likes to spike certain axes when it kind of generates the plane into the, the sim world. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, there's other, there's other games like IL-2. If you have ever been in a sim rig on a multi-crew bomber or the, you know, a multi-crew aircraft and you switch positions, you will feel a giant spike in telemetry because oh, wow. it doesn't smooth it. Because what it says is like, oh, you're a pilot and you're flying up at, you know, you know, 200 knots or something like that. Oh, you're going to switch to the rear gunner. Well, that's actually he's now moving reverse. Right. You know, at the opposite speed and pointed down. Yeah. And pitch versus you were pitched. And so <laughs> IL-2 will just quickly change. And it is the most jarring experience. So <sighs> it's like. Buggy telemetry exists. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, there's certain cars and racing sims that drop you into the to the the track. Um, pit limiters. They don't think about how the physics of the pit limiter occurs. You know, for a motion simulator, but that could be very jarring as well. So the thing is, is like, what well, you like? Well, how do you resolve those? It's like sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's just maybe better to turn off motion when that occurs. You know, like I think there was someone that asked about like, how do I balance like when I eject out of an aircraft, it's very violent. It's like you could try to tune for that, but now everything else will feel dull yeah. because the ejection yeah. is so extreme in terms yeah. of telemetry. I'm like, turn off motion or yeah. don't crash. Yeah, <laughs> right? don't, don't eject. So you don't, you know. There are some limitations. So, which again, from a psychological out. standpoint, like you said, you shouldn't want to crash. You shouldn't want to have to eject. So, <laughs> it gives you a little incentive there, folks. Exactly. So. But unfortunately, it's not always easy. And, and you have spike yeah. filters and other things like, say, the overall smoothing that can help mitigate it. Um, but there are just certain events that will be a little bit jarring at times. Well, like I said, the worst one I ever have been in was uh, War Thunder, and I just got both wings blown off. And this thing sent. That's the only time I've had to hit the emergency brake because yep. this thing was throwing me like. Yep. I mean, I was like, this thing's going to come apart. Yep. So, um, you know, that's extreme. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's where you'll see the difference between some sims and you'll, you'll be like, what sims has the best telemetry? And that was one thing I wanted to hit on with max telemetry is okay. that what when I consider a game that has good telemetry means it has larger values. It has headroom to work within so that, you know, for surge, it might be from zero to 15 or higher. Um, or for Sway, it might be from 0 to 42 or something. Bad telemetry to me is not just buggy, but also very low values. And you will see yeah. that sometimes in developers that will have low values, whether it's hacks like um, the Richard Burns Rally Racing. Unfortunately, Assetto Corsa and Assetto Corsa Competizione have very low values for Heave. So your max telemetry might be 3. Yeah. It might be 2. So you're like, okay, well, how do I lower the max telemetry? I can go to one or zero. Right? Yeah. That's all I have to play with. Other than that, I have to adjust the sliders and the, the smoothing as much as I can. And there's just not a lot of headroom for that. So that's why you might feel better heave telemetry, better road telemetry in games like iRacing or Automobilist 2 because they have great heave telemetry. And you jump over to set of Corsa or ACC, and you're like, I don't feel the same. It's like because the telemetry just isn't there. Yeah. And so it's it's a thing when you're analyzing the telemetry, and it's something I take into account when I'm tuning those different sims. Is what do I have to work with? Yeah. And, and try to make the best experience. And there's I nothing can. you can really do about it. There's nothing SRS can do. There's nothing DOF can. There's nothing anybody can do except for the programmers. Yeah. They're they're the, the ones. And that's why you'll see my campaigns, like the Elite Dangerous one, oh. like, hey, add telemetry, please. You know, make it good. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell us about, I mean, <laughs> Elite Dangerous, I love that game. But mm -hmm. every time there's an update, two yep. things happen. No more motion in the flight sim, and yep. Jeff's going to send out, hey, contact Frontier to yep. tell him to release. Mike, so what's the issue say. there? What, why, why, why does it not work, and what would it take for them to do it? Why are so, they not? So there's there's two ways that telemetry occurs. One is the developer um, supports it by exporting the telemetry on a UDP packet. Basically, it's just a way that you know software can grab the telemetry and and know what's going on within the game externally. And then the other way is when the developers don't support it, um, modders or people like on X Simulator or otherwise will use um, basically packet sniffers and the UDP sniffers to kind of look at the 
the memory locations, maybe considered a cheat program, to see what the memory is reporting for that particular value for pitch, right? And really it is just running a, a, a software, looking at the memory, sitting in Elite Dangerous and moving the controller to the left. What value changed? Oh, it's this memory location. Let me move it to the right. Okay, that looks like that's the role memory location. So here's the memory location, you know, for that particular role value. So that Sim Racing Studio and other motion software can look at that memory location and grab the the actual telemetry value for pitch and roll because the developer isn't exporting it now. So so Elite Dangerous does not export telemetry. They, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Wow. So so every time a patch happens, someone, uh, a guy named Wagner right now on an X simulator, will use this like basically cheat software to yeah. look at what the memory location is has to go into each one and experiment with pitch, roll, surge, whatever, to try to find it, and then creates an XML file that has those memory locations that we can utilize. Um, and, you know, there's very few other games, if any, that aren't supporting it. Like, Star Citizen doesn't yet. Hopefully, they will one day in the future. They're supposed um, to. It was one of, yeah, their, one of their one things. Of their things. But and and Elite Dangerous and Frontier have acknowledged it's an issue. It is on. I think it's finally reached the number four position in acknowledged issues. Um, but they still haven't added it. What does right. it take for them to add it? Maybe one developer for maybe half a day to look at the, the, the programs that Sim Racing Studio has provided and other programs are provided within GitHub and whatnot. Up to saying, hey, for this value. Don't change it every time you patch it and export it on this UDP packet. And that's all you need to do. Because every time they patch it, it might change that memory yeah. location. And yeah, it, therefore, seems, it does. It, yeah. it definitely seems to because, uh, yeah, oh, there was so, a patch. So I'll do another campaign here soon. I didn't do it for patch. I think it was the last one. I need to do it again, um, which is the only way it'll get added by Frontier is when the, the community keeps vocally saying it, yeah. you know, like getting the Nubifier to do a video on it would be yeah. one of my dreams. Getting more people to go to Frontier and to saying, hey, Frontier, just get one dev yeah, or maybe just on. a few days, whatever it may take to add it here. And then you've supported motion platforms for the rest of the game life. Yeah. Right? And that's all it is. And like every every automobile sim, major sim does it. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator does it. Uh, DCS does it. IL2, etc. Squadrons. Yeah, you name it. If if it's a simulator, it probably supports exporting telemetry, except for Elite Dangerous and Frontier, which is the main reason I got into this. So yeah, I know, right? The does it. Yeah. So the main community, the community does it. If one day Wagner stops doing it, trust me, I have the software. I'll learn how to do it. it might take a few weeks. But there's no way. I know because there's a lot of that galaxy still left to be explored. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we still got so, left to. Do. Well, and then so the same thing is with squadrons and with Star Wars squadrons. They obviously yeah. don't export. They don't even have any. Nope. So um, I think someone tried to find it from a memory export, and it technically you could probably find you, it. You can. The problem is if you multiplayer, which I love, dog. Yeah, that's it. Then you're running a cheat. You're running a it's hack. A cheat. Yeah. And so I just have to use the joystick emulator. And it's it's still cool, but it's like, come on, guys. Exactly. And that's the thing, because it, it has to sniff the memory packets, yeah. and therefore a software will detect it's a cheat. Yeah, and, and, and like, you're not like, cheating. Cause... I'm actually making it harder, because I'm moving. Exactly. It's harder to be competitive when you're moving around. So. Exactly. But so, all right. have like, the joystick emulator and stuff like that that works for the, yeah. the games that don't. But, yeah, if we get that's really my biggest thing is, is going out to the community. You'll see my ask all the time. It's like the, the squeaky wheel gets oiled. Yeah. The more that we grow as a community, the more developers see that it's a requirement for Sims. Just export it on a UDP yeah. pack and you're done. You don't, you don't yeah. shut up. <laughs> yeah, you've done enough other stuff. Come on. Just give us the exactly. Same thing. So, exactly. yeah. No, I agree. Um, so, let's. So the things I really want to talk about. So, this has been interesting for me. Um, you recently moved from the DOF, and I know you're going back to it, but you've now gone to an actuator based um, platform. So, tell us a little bit about your new platform. And then I want to get your pros and cons and just your read, because I've only had the DOF. Uh, that's all I've had. So so tell us about this thing, and then give me a, an analysis of what you think and how it compares. I mean, just, just kind of a thousand-foot view here. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, fortunately, I was able to, to get the, the PT actuator, um, a 60 UF platform that uses seven actuators. Um, it also sits on a SimLabs P1X frame. Um 
And I primarily use VR, but I also have a 49-inch a ultrawide that I use for, like, tuning and whatnot. And it's got all the fun stuff of the SRS wind kits, yep. uh, butt kickers, and stuff like that. Um, the, the thing that I would – how I like to always put the difference between the two is – the a DOF reality platform is very much like, say, an entry platform if you're mm-hmm. not sure about motion, um, that you're limited on your budget, and you still want to have an immersive – yeah, you still want to have an immersive experience. They're good platforms for that. Um, the, the the analogy I love to use is a DOF platform is like going to a car club on the weekends and racing there and having everyone has their different cars, everyone is sharing the information, um, and – that's and it's fun and that's a passionate thing that a lot of people do um, on the weekends and do things. When you get to say a, a, an actuator platform, it's like getting going and moving into like say GT3 racing, um, and this one might be considered like F1 racing, right? It's primarily a lot more expensive, right? You're now double if not triple the price of a DOF sure. rig, and it's like you know, are you getting double and triple the fun? Right. Is there a difference? So I always like to put that in perspective. It's like, which one's better? It's like they're different experiences. Yeah. Right. And that the, the cost of entry into an actuator platform is a lot more than, say, a DOF reality. So one, if, if you're if you have a budget for one, then, yeah, get an actuator platform. Um, but they're not cheap. Um, the right. biggest differences that I saw moving from them is one, of course, the rigidity of the platform. So it's a sim, a Simlabs P1X frame on an actuator platform. So it's all aluminum extrusion. It's super solid. And I think it's really neat that a lot of people are modding their DOF reality platforms into extrusion. Sure. You know, I had an older version. Um, and so that in that P6 video, you saw a lot of the strengthening that I did on it to yeah. reduce flex, right? The wheel, wheel, I, your yeah, wheel plate. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. a lot of that different stuff. And... Um, and I think it's neat that DOF Reality is taking some of those ideas that we as a community did and, and building them into their platform. But that was the first thing that I realized was just how incredibly rigid, you know, the platform is. It just has no flex at all. Um, and then the movement capabilities. Yes, actuators are extremely smooth. Um, they're extremely okay. fast and they have a lot of fidelity. The new SFU gears um, have that smoothness. But that's where you get into, say, uh, a stepper motor with an encoder you know, and with the stroke that you have, it has about 65,000 potential positions. Yeah. Um, the older DOF, the older sensors and the older gears had about 1,025, yeah. right? So it's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, but again, I always like to say there's a huge difference in cost. Well, right? and take the, we know it's more expensive, but I want to get down to the experience of it. I mean, what are you, um, I, like, what are you noticing from usage? What, what, Tell me about the experience between the two. Yeah, the the, the biggest difference in experiences, I would say, is the fidelity and being able to feel, like, say, for racing, the road, right? You don't need shaker kits for the suspension. You can feel all the tiny little bumps. You can feel the curves really well. Um, You, um, the the speed and accuracy of, say, the surge actuator um, and the sway actuators on this, because this is a 60 OF, um, I can feel everything from the gear shifts to the small accelerations, feathering the throttle, and it feels smooth and realistic. The okay. sway, warming the tires, changing lanes. I can feel the smoothness within that. And, and, and then as with the actuators as well, I can fine tune adding in pitch and roll into those translational axes of pitch and, or uh, into surge and sway. So I can have the body, you know, dip forward a little bit while it moves forward or backwards. Okay. Um, the the speed as well and that accuracy sure. um, is, is is a double edged sword, right? It's very easy to overtune these. It's very easy to get to the point where it's just like literally wants to jump off the platform. That's how sure. fast and strong these are. Sure. Right? Um, so you have to tune it to be able to get within that motion. Um, but the other thing that you know from that experience, say for flight sims, um, is again the fidelity of the smoothness. Right. Sure. I, I can see where that'd be huge. I can do long translational, you know, degrees. It's got a 10 degree pitch on both sides. So 20 degrees total where you can just slowly go from the left and slowly go from the right and pitch down as you want. Um, these types of frames I like as well versus say a hexapod. There was like a thread on that too, where, you know, I can have the, the sway 
um, and yaw axis is independent of heave and pitch. So I'm not limited in terms of where I can right. do a hexabod because they're all tied together. Um, so those are nice. And then um, extruded aluminum is just the way to go. You know, yeah, he- hexapod is the design we have where it's it's a hexagon yeah. with the arms. So that's that's yeah. what that is. Yeah. So um, so I I mean it's that whole thing of um, you know the difference in experience. Yes, it's amazing. I mean, I'll sure. be honest. You know, when I got it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, incredible. Um, but I always would say it, but it never negated the fun that I had with them in my P3 or my, my P6. You right. know, those fun experiences, it's a different thing. It's like going from a club car that you fix up your M- Mazda MX-5 and you have your turbo and you have the different paddle shifters. And then one day says, like, that's cool. Do you want to try this F1? And yeah. you're like, Oh my God! Right? Guess it's, what? The F one's more expensive. <laughs> exactly, the F one's more expensive. So, are there are there any negatives? I mean, uh, obviously the price, but like noise. What are there any th- any negatives to that that people should be aware of? I think um, besides the price, of course, um, yeah. it definitely does have a bigger footprint. Right. Yeah. To get into yeah. it, um, you know, um, you are going to have an external control box with. Um, you know, with all the actuator servos on it. So again, there's more space that takes that's involved within it. Um, the the noise isn't too much, but again, the noise of the actuators are actually rather quiet. It's actually just you're moving a I don't know how much this thing weighs now, <laughs> but you're moving like several hundred pounds fast. Yeah, right? I mean these are industrial you know stepper motors, so it's it it just will move and you can shape the house, right? It's literally. Um, now is it is it bolted to the floor? No, it's just okay. this one's on carpet, so it doesn't slide. Um, and again, that's where I go into my motion tuning. It's like I, you know, you will always realize, and that's a thing that I will will say as well is that sometimes a lot of times people will think bigger actuators are better or more movement is better. Um, the thing I will always remind everyone is that, but the telemetry stays the same, right? The sim doesn't know that you have this big large right platform. and that if i need to move you from the right you know you know a foot and then back to the left it's going to be in the same amount of time i move you to the left six inches and back i can guarantee just by pure physics <laughs> this is going to feel very jarring right mm-hmm. so going to 200 or going to 300 or bigger actuators you start to run into problems where you do need to limit certain accesses okay right? like for pitch and roll you're usually fine you know, you can pitch right. and roll, but when you're getting the surge and gear shifting, you're getting into sway where it's really quick. Sometimes those movements become too jarring, so you end up actually limiting the motion. So you're kind of where we were with the SFUs in that we had to artificially limit motion because we were starting to run into exactly our, ourselves. The the chassis was hitting itself. Was hitting so. itself, or it might need more smoothing, so it, it curves out those certain axes that are extreme. So that's where, like, the SFUs, are, you know, I'm excited to get to see, like, how how do those need to be balanced um, with but is the current potential movement, because, again, the maximum limit tells the, the tell Sim Racing Studio when to move the platform to its maximum potential movement. Yeah. So if the, if the max telemetries are, are a little too low or whatnot, you know, that are based off of this, maybe the sliders need to be moved or, or adjusted. Um, so it's always a matter of making sure that the, the motion profile fits the platform as well, which is a key piece. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, I mean, it's definitely fun. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's not about it. Um, but that's why I always will tell people, it's like, if you have the budget and you know, you're going to love the sport and you're independent in, in the sim, the PCs, yeah. you know, definitely consider, you know, an actuator platform. If you're not really sure if you're on a budget and you just want to have fun and you're maybe occasionally going to use it maybe once or twice a week, then consider a DOF and you can kind of sure. go from there. And and the fun part, as everyone knows that's in this hobby, upgrades happen all the time. There's, there's <laughs> they're never done, like you said. They're never done. Just you're like never. motion profiles, they're never done. Exactly. So, exactly. So, well, I appreciate I was just curious because obviously everybody probably aspires to something like that. And I just wanted to get your honest opinion on the pros and cons because there's pros and cons to everything. So I wanted to see kind of what your thought after using it for a while, you know, what your genuine experience was. So um, so really, it's just a cost thing and just having to not destroy it or the house. <laughs> yeah. With I your mean, settings. Costs, and, and the costs are coming down, too. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the thing I love about this. This hobby, too, is. 
you know, all of us wanted actuator, you know, platforms five, 10 years ago when we were, you know, younger and whatnot. Yeah. They were like $40,000. Yeah. And there's some actuator platforms out there, which I don't know why, but are 40 to 60, 80, $100,000. Industrial. They, they, just, want, they want that big sell. They just, so. they just, there's my dog. There's your, your dog alarm. So, yeah, my dog alarm. He needs to go outside. It's been almost two hours, Jeff. It's time for me to go out. <laughs> so, so, but, um, He's, um, but yeah, that's that. I honestly think it's just they're just overpriced at the moment, right? Yeah. The, the manufacturing can come down; they can get cheaper, and they will. Um, yeah. But you know, people need to make a living. I, I get that. Um, but competition is is happening, and I think the prices will continue to drop as as more and more people start looking for them and wanting to have them. Um, well, and and the um, more companies like DOF that are giving. Uh, alternatives that are more affordable that's yeah. going to force the market so yeah. yeah it's it's not a bad thing so so well if you got to take your dog out i think it's the yeah. good place but you have to do something get your dog put the dog on camera we have to see the dog you can't <laughs> you can't hear the dog and not see the dog that's kind of a rule of youtube so we need to see Please. the dog here so this one this is i see if you can see him this oh is, yeah this is this is kane this is one doberman race and this is the one that was crying. Uh, Camera shy. Race. There he is. He's my boy. <laughs> He's and this is a, oh, year, yeah. a year and a half old Doberman. Two both nice. Dobermans. He's kind of a mix and raises a Doberman. And they're nice. my boys. And they need to go outside. <laughs> well, we will let you go then. Um, okay. I appreciate, as always, I appreciate your time. Um, and then we will get into... Um, you know, I, I still haven't done any motion comp. We maybe the, tri the trilogy. Yeah, we'll we need to talk about motion compensation, but uh, we'll do that when the dogs are are settled in. So, on that note, thank you guys for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, like and subscribe if you want to see part three with the uh, the dog walk and the motion <laughs> compensation. And Jeff, I can't thank you enough for your time. Oh, yeah. Um, really do appreciate it. And I hope, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was educational. I know I learned stuff. Hopefully, you did too. So, Jeff. Take those dogs outside, and until next time, my friend, remember to get your game on. <laughs> See you.